Good morning, my friend. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and I'm so grateful to have you with me today for another episode of the Self Brain Surgery Podcast. Today is Veterans Day. You're going to hear this a few days from now, but it's Veterans Day in the United States, the day that we honor our folks that have served or are serving in the military. And of course, you know my story, having spent 14 years in the United States Air Force and a big part of 2005 in a combat hospital in the Iraq war and how much my service affects who I am today and, and the things we talk about on this show a lot. And so today I wanted to have a guest that we could reframe our thinking about veterans and the military and Veterans Day and some things you may not even know about what's going on inside the military culture for the last 20 years or so as we've been in this posture of being at war and now we've transitioned really away from being in a war posture again and what the impact of that culture shift has had on people inside the military and retirees and veterans and their families. And we have an incredible guest today. Corey Weathers is a licensed professional counselor. She's a sought after speaker, consultant, and author of the award winning first book, Sacred Spaces My Journey to the Heart of Military Marriage. Her husband is a career uh, military chaplain, he's still serving on active duty. And over the past two decades, Corey has focused her career as a clinical consultant that specializes in marriage, military culture, special forces, and leadership development. She's traveled all over the world with the United States Secretary of Defense. She's been to Turkey, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Persian Gulf to visit troops and report on deployment conditions. She facilitates transformative workshops and retreats for service members and families all around the world. And in addition to providing subject matter expertise on military culture, she can consults organizations and institutions on building trust, creating impactful programming, and working within a multi-generational team. Her advocacy has included White House initiatives and contributing to the passing of a congressional bill for licensure portability. Corey is an expert on military culture, and she's going to give us some things to think about and even help us change our mind about what we say to people on Veterans Day. She's written an incredible new book, Military Culture Shift, The Impact of War, Money, and Generational Perspective on Morale, Retention, and Leadership. The book is available everywhere books are sold today, so get yourself a copy if you're interested in this incredibly powerful and important look at what's going on inside our military. It's based on more than 15 years of research that Corey has done. Military Culture Shift offers insights from the counseling office as well as perspectives on the effect of Department of Defense's budget budget decisions, changes in generational views of authority, and emerging social trends within the military community post 9-11. So friend, whether you're a military leader, a historian, a politician, an educator, a counselor, a service member, a family member, or just somebody who loves a veteran or people who have served, Military Culture Shift will encourage you to understand and embrace important things like how past decisions have led to the current state of wellness, how generational differences in motivation and views of authority impact the military, ways in which learning styles impact training, why families aren't turning up for in-person and social events, why communication shifts impact cohesiveness so much, information distribution strategies that help, and leadership strategies to influence positive changes going forward. This is an incredible book, and we had a great talk on Veterans Day with Corey Weathers. I'm so grateful that Corey took the time. She'll be back on the show another time to talk about some faith elements and some things that she's learned being a military spouse for so long. I had a great talk with Corey, and she helped me change my mind. Even me, a veteran, a veteran of a foreign war, she helped me have a little different language around what to say instead of, thank you for your service. I think it'll help you change your mind and change your life about what's going on in the military. It'll give you something else to think about today. It's a tremendous episode, and I can't recommend her book, Military Culture Shift, more highly than I do. And before we get started with Corey, I just have one question for you. Hey, are you ready to change your life? If the answer is yes, there's only one rule. You have to change your mind first. And my friend, there's a place where the neuroscience of how your mind works smashes together with faith and everything starts to make sense. Are you ready to change your life? Well, this is the place, Self Brain Surgery School. I'm Dr. Lee Warren, and this is where we go deep into how we're wired, take control of our thinking, and find real hope. This is where we learn to become healthier, feel better, and be happier. This is where we leave the past behind and transform our minds. This is where we start today. Are you ready? This is your podcast. This is your place. This is your time, my friend. Let's get after it. Mm 
Friend, I'm so excited to be back with you for another episode of the podcast, and I've got a really important topic and a powerful guest for you today. I'm glad to introduce you to a new friend. Corey Weathers is with us today. Welcome, Corey. Thank you so much for having me, Lee. I'm super excited. Absolutely. Me too. Hey, give us a 30,000-foot view of the work that you do and how you came to do this work. You probably... uh, not a lot of folks out there who have dedicated their lives in this area of supporting the military culture like you have. So talk to us about that. Yeah. So um, I'm a military spouse and we have huge issues in um, spouse employment. And so I'm a mental health clinician by trade. Um, I started my career as a mental health clinician and always knew that I wanted to do that. And of course, as my um, as my husband joined the military, as we started to serve together, at one point, fast forward, I had five different licenses in different states trying to build this career and serve. Um, and really, I had transitioned to serving military and ser- military service members and their families, um, really enjoying that work. I mean, it's just an incredible community to work with and also live with. And, um, and I started to hear all of these similar issues from counseling session to counseling session. It was almost like I was on loop. And, and what made me really sad is that the people that were coming in for those sessions didn't know that someone else was also going through what they were going through. Um, and then fast forward again, I found myself traveling and speaking and teaching, whether it was leadership development or doing um, spouse groups or working with um, events for couples in the military. And again, testing out some of these trends and issues that I'd heard from the counseling office across all branches, across all people. And that really um, turned into a love for studying this culture, studying the people. So I basically took my clinical background and kind of zoomed out to really examine um, this military culture that's a subculture of America and really get to understand the impact of war on the culture, whether it was just war on the service member that get, tends to get a lot more attention than how war impacts the spouse and the kids as well. And so that has led to 15 years of collecting information and watching all of these trends to finally put it all in a book and try to tell the story of how we got to where we are today, which is dealing with um, a new recruitment crisis, retention crisis, and on the brink of potential more global conflict. Wow. So it, give us a sense, if you will, of what I, I was in a long time ago. I served in the Iraq war and you know, spent uh, half of 2005 in a tent hospital in, in Iraq and did 200 brain surgeries in the field and all that. But it's not the same animal that it was almost 20 years ago now. And what has 20 years of being in a war posture done to the military family and the culture there? Yeah, such a big question. And it's one of the reasons why I knew I wanted to take a generational perspective at looking at um, those shifts that have happened. Um, what you were just describing coming in in 2005, um, serving, in, serving in Iraq, a lot of the families that were in that, you know, po- post 9-11, coming in after 9-11, up till about 2010, 2011, um, were a lot of Gen X, maybe a few very young millennials, but a lot of your boomers and Gen X really were serving during that first decade. And that first decade was a time where if you if you served during those years, especially family members serving to the, during those years, the community really took care of them, t- took care of each other. You know, my whole entire neighborhood was deployed at the same time. We raised each other's kids. We made yeah. meals for each other. It just was an incredibly cohesive um, community. And there's a lot of variables that I, I really try to pull apart because there's it's a wicked problem. There's so many variables that have contributed to what it is today. Um, but the, I, the easiest way I could say is that the culture really shifted to an online culture. And yeah. in many ways, that's really good in that we can stay connected and we have access to resources and information. And we found ways for it to be a good thing in our community. It also has helped kind of contribute to breaking down a lot of the cohesiveness that we once had. So for those of us who have been in um, long enough that we experienced that first decade, it is a completely different culture um, since especially 2011. And what's that? What has that done to, let's say, mental health uh, of the average soldier, sailor, Marine, Air Force member, and their families? This is a you know the, the military suicide, veteran suicide issue is a big deal. What what is that? 
culture playing into mental health? Play yeah, play? so many contributing variables. It's, you know, you know, um, the body and the, the biopsychosocial connection um, to issues that you see manifesting in the body, right? And I think that's the same thing when we look at, at the systemic issues that we're seeing in the, in the military culture. When you have several variables happening at once, it's a system. And so they all kind of play off of each other. So for example, two decades of a global conflict was a very long time for a lot of our service members and their families to endure that much stress. Um, and not every generation went through all of those um, 20 years. You know, I would yeah. say Gen X and Boomer definitely did. Um, and so they're coming out of that two decades with um, burnout and seeing their kids dealing with mental health issues. Those were the military kids that watched their parents go through that in incredible operation tempo that we went through. Um, and so there is um, lo more loneliness than ever. And that's across all generations, um, more loneliness, more isolation. Um, a lot of spouses, for example, when you're talking about mental health, put themselves and their self-care, even their um, their medical care on the back burner for 15 years. Yeah. And now we're seeing some of those issues um, come, come, um, come up more than ever. Um, mental health is a huge topic across the board right now. And some people might be listening going, I thought that it's always been an issue in the military. And it has been. We've had suicide being um, a big topic that even Americans are tracking for the veteran population. But there is more significant mental health issues today than we've ever seen before, as well as Gen Z coming in with some of the stressors that they went through in the, their most formative years dealing with mental health issues that are coming into the force as well. So it's a very complicated um, question to answer that has many layers to it. Yeah. And what do you think the, you know, the average person out there, we hear on the news, things like, you know, recruiting is at an all time low and, and things like that. And, and so the natural question then is, well, who's watching the shop if we don't have enough soldiers and sailors and airmen and what's going to change? And people are talking about things like the draft again. Like it, it obviously we're not going to let the military close for business. So, so what happens and what are people talking about in that community about how we rebuild our fighting force and, and keep our country safe while also protecting our people and their families? Yeah, this is a huge um, passion of mine. Part of it is we're actively serving still. We're not, we have about five years until we could retire and on the 20 year system. And I also have Gen Z kids. One of them is 19 and considering joining the Air Force. So, you know, we, and I also have a 16 year old that doesn't want to join the military that if we were to, to have a draft, like you may have no choice, right? So, um, it's a very real, um, important topic that we need to talk about. In fact, I think it's really easy to, for Americans to hear that there is a recruitment crisis and think maybe this is just um, dramatic language so that more people will join and and will plus up the numbers. But this is genuinely an, an authentic crisis that we're having because fewer Gen Z are joining than ever. Um, and that cohort that I just described a few minutes ago that's burned out and dealing with um, needing to take care of their family and their marriage and themselves after two decades are discouraging their Gen Z kids from joining. And um, compared to World War II, when one out of every 12 Americans was serving, that meant everybody knew somebody who was serving yeah. compared to today where it's one out of 200. And so it's wow. very likely that um, the average American citizen doesn't know somebody that's serving and doesn't know um, what the cost of that service is and, and perhaps is so far removed from the military culture, but also so far removed from the knowing that we had from World War II that it's, it's easy to just kind of hope that a draft isn't going to happen and the DOD will fix itself. But to your point, um, the DOD and the, the defense isn't going to and shouldn't close its doors. It will find ways to um, protect our country. That's what it's built to do. And so I don't want to see a draft happen. And it's an incredible um, community to be a part of. It can be an incredible career to be a part of as well. Yeah. Um, so it's an important conversation to have. Well, what do you think the, the moving parts are of the, the cultural pieces of what's happening that's, that's damaging and hurting recruiting right now? What are some of those elements that are, that are going on? Yeah, um, definitely. I don't want to keep like being on the same soapbox. Definitely. I'm um, Gen X discouraging Gen Z. Um, we see a lot. In fact, I, I said this in an interview earlier today. Um, 
so much is online and, um, and that can be a good thing. Um, but people are now able to authentically share their stories, share their feelings, share the behind the scenes of what's happening in not just the military, but any job that they're at. Yeah. Um, they look behind the curtain more easily than they could. Yes. And every institution, every business has to think about this. Um, it's really calling all of our businesses and institutions to a place of transparency and accountability because there's really no way to push anything under the rug or to ignore it until it goes away. Or even um, what I think has happened in the past, which is kind of just kind of waiting out a cohort until they retire out and we start over fresh with some more troops. Like this is um, something where it's a so much more visible than ever, whether we get it right or whether we get it wrong. And so I think that that is definitely creating a lot of stress for the Department of Defense as Gen Z not only is sharing authentically some things that such as like mold and housing and mold and barracks that they're doing a they're using these platforms to hold the institution accountable to make sure that they're fixed. Um, but they're also it's a, it can be a little bit confusing that Gen Z uses um, short form video and uses memes and uses these platforms to also be creative in their expression. And so some of those expressions can sound dark in their humor and not necessarily be, they're not actually, for example, this morning I saw a TikTok of Gen Z saying how much they hated their life, especially now that they joined the military. And part of it was true, but also part of it was creative dark humor. So it's hard to tell the difference. Either way, it can seem like bad marketing and really, um, but if it's true, it's also giving a look behind the curtain. And that's something the DOD is having to take a look at now. Yeah, I was thinking as you were talking about when I signed up, I received a scholarship from the Air Force to go to medical school. And the recruiting interaction that I had about, hey, what's this going to be like? And what's the, you know, what I was concerned about things like, will I be allowed to choose the specialty that I want? And will I be have any, you know, any say in where I go to train? And all those kinds of questions. And the recruiters in, in those days were all you had. Like there was, you had to basically take somebody's word that you were going to sign this contract and not get sent off to be an infantryman in South Korea somewhere, but actually get to go to medical school, right? Because once you sign the contract, you're in. But nowadays, it's like these kids know everything. They, they know a thousand people on their favorite video game that have done the thing, and they're chatting with them 24-7. Like, it's got to be a real challenge for the recruiting environment. It just kind of, it's kind of a fascinating social problem, isn't it? Yeah, they, they really are. In fact, um, there is some talk about DOD actually embracing some of Gen Z and even millennials um, platforms. You know, in the past, you know, I even remember a time where there was a lot of fear going online as a service member, especially, you know, a lot of fear of like not being in uniform if I'm, I'm going to be on my Facebook profile or Instagram or whatever. And there was a lot of regulations trying to figure out how to control social media and trying to protect um the institution, if you will. And now it's just expanded so much that in some cases, some of even the Gen Z TikTokers, is that even a word, TikTokers? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I made it up if it isn't. But um, the DOD is seeing that some of their influence in a positive way is contributing to recruitment. So it's kind of a very confusing time of how do we control a narrative from an institutional perspective and and make sure that there's some form of regulation, which the DOD is known for and it, and it actually thrives really well in. And at the same time, you can't um, control everybody's private, personal platforms. And so the truth right. kind of gets out there in those ways. And so it's kind of a very confusing time even for the institution to try to figure out um, how do we mitigate? How do we, hopefully, my my hope would be that they would um, become even more transparent and engage in dialogue and conversation with the community, with the culture, to heal what needs to be healed, to address what needs to be addressed, um, and, and be okay with the transparency that I think every institution is faced to, um, to embrace. So you, you call your book Military Culture Shift. And so what's the shift that, that – what, what are you trying to get at here? So the average listener, like I'm, I'm thinking about reading this book. Like what, am I, what am I getting myself into if I invest the time to, to get involved in this topic? What, what's, the, yeah. what's your drive here? Yeah, you know, um, it's, such, it's such a deeply layered book. It's hard to answer it in one sentence. But I will say there was definitely one big shift that happened. I called it the Great Culture Shift in 2011 where – <clears throat> the culture mostly went online. We had um, defense 
our defense uh, funding just tanked when sequestration yeah. hit, hit around 2013. And so many variables all at once created a massive shift. It wasn't just money going down. We were also entering into a two, the second decade of the war. It was also, we were starting to get um, tired from the, the serving into a second decade and the operation tempos. Yeah. Our kids were starting to feel it all at the same time. And millennials were starting to come in for the very first time and experiencing a military that nobody else had ever experienced before. And so while I can talk about having being in a neighborhood where everybody took care of each other and everything was in person, that was definitely not what millennials were experiencing after 2011. So there was definitely a big shift, um, but there was also little tiny mini shifts that happened um, throughout history. And so I think the main goal that I wanted to do with the book is number one, um, whoever is reading the book to really ignite compassion in hearing the story, hearing the story of our military culture, not just the history of it, but the story of how did we get to where we are right now and why is that important? Because it is so crucial to our national security. It's, it's, it matters to if you have kids, if you have Gen Z kids and whether or not we could have a draft. Um, but it's also about how our American values have shifted over time. Whereas people in World War One, World War Two joined out of a sense of patriotism, or maybe they didn't join, they just, um, rallied around and all believed in something similar, all had a common value system, all yeah. had um, an agreement of what was right and what was wrong. And even if you were a doctor, you found a way to support war efforts, right? So we all had yeah. this common, cohesive country, if you will, not perfect, right? But there was more cohesiveness than there is now. And so I really wanted to show how, you know, the military culture is, it mirrors the American culture in a lot of ways. But it is something that if we could just tell the story and bring all of these news stories and all of the research and all the information together to help people hear the story of the people that especially went through the last two decades of war, my hope is that we raise compassion, we raise empathy so that we have something more to say other than thank you for your service, that we have something other to say, even if it's um, just saying thank you for carrying the burden on my behalf or thank you for I see you. I see what your family went through. I see what you're carrying every day and I appreciate it. I'm um, just changing that dialogue just a little bit because it, it's really hard nowadays to see a person, much less see a culture and how they've evolved over time. Yeah, that's so that's so important and so powerful. And I resonate with everything that you're saying. And I'm I'm thinking about what we all watched on television when we pulled out of Afghanistan, and and I had on a personal level and, and had conversations with a lot of friends. My, my best friend is a ranger who was in Afghanistan 2010, 2011, Silver Star guy. And he said, why were we there? You know, what did we do? We just left, like, and, and we just handed him all our weapons. Like, So uh, there was a lot of this sort of sense of loss of purpose, right, of why did we do the things that we do if we can just turn a switch and walk away from there. And that had to, I, I thought, had to have impacted the people who are still in and their families. Like, what... What has the end of the of the global war on terror, the war in Afghanistan, what has that done inside the house? Yeah, uh, it's such a big question. And I, honestly, that season was, I think, the catalyst of why I wanted to write the book, because I had been walking, not only living with this culture as being a military spouse myself, going through those deployments, trying to raise my kids, moving more times than I wanted to move. Like I was living it, but I was also working with the community and so doing whatever I could to support them through it. And, and I think that um, I was seeing the stress and the tension build, the compounding impact of stress over time just continue to build and escalate. Meanwhile, service families, what's amazing about them is that they're gritty. They will be resilient even if they don't want to be. They find a way to kind of bolster themselves and push through difficult circumstances. They rarely complain. Um, the culture even kind of teaches them to not complain. And so um, yeah. I was watching this build almost like a, a shaken up Coke bottle. And I was like, we are going to either implode or explode. And about that time, COVID hit. And I, yeah. um, what I saw was almost a psychological breaking point for the community um, that it was just, I mean, it was too much for everybody to go through. But when you put that on top of what the military culture was already carrying a burden of, it was too much. And, and then I realized COVID as, as rough as it was, was a false peak. Um, really when that, the, um, exit from Afghanistan happened, that was 
the, the culmination of all of that stress, that was the imploding or exploding. And so it was a combination of things that happened. I got so many calls from spouses, both veteran spouses, they were retired and out, and those that were still in that were incredibly worried about their service member who was now reliving all kinds of trauma and was having reactions very similar to what you were just describing of um, what did all this mean? People who had lost friends, like what was it for? The media was yeah. asking hard questions like that. And it was really causing families to regress in all the work that they had done. But spouses then were having to put their own feelings about the um, the end of, of GWAT on their own. They had to put their own feelings on the back burner to take care of their service members and their kids. Yeah. So that bottled up even more. And then, of course, what we ended up seeing is mass chaos in response to that, which is a very interesting topic um, in that for the first time ever, the DOD was doing the best that they could to handle a very difficult situation. And veterans um, found their own, especially special operation veterans, found their own way there to do what they had always been trained to do. And so yep. everything kind of institutionally, the structure fell apart. Um, in some, in some big ways, some, in some ways, some beautiful ways. Um, and that it was an incredible, um, see, just seeing everybody come together and do the best they could to do the right thing. Um, yeah. and active duty service members who did really heroic things and really showed their character of how to do the right thing, even when you're in difficult circumstances. So there was so many reactions, but culturally from a, a high level, culturally, um, the community crashed after that. And that's, I think, contributing yeah. to the recruitment crisis and the retention crisis that I think is coming up next. Um, it's It just really affected the community as a whole. Wow. I look back and I think about my own life, you know, the PTSD and the, and the, the things I remember, the, the babies that got blown up and the, and the soldiers who died and the ones that didn't and, and the relationships I have with some of the ones I was able to take care of there. And, and what I recall happening to myself over the last almost 20 years is this, this evolution of what it was for and what it meant. Because all of us, I think, at some point, especially in regards to Iraq, I mean, all of us came to some conclusions over time. We weren't there for why we thought we were there. You know, it didn't it didn't really turn out to be the same thing we thought it was. But then you have to say, well, why was I there? And I, for me, I came down on this place where I said I was there to take care of people who got shot and blown up. And I was there to help other people navigate how to handle extreme stress and to figure out what I was capable of doing in those moments. And, and I worked around – some of the best people in the world, right? These people that we're talking about, the, the special forces community and the line soldiers and, and the aircraft mechanics, they are the most giving, dedicated people in the world. And so I think when you look at what it was for, it was for joining together as a team and in a community to accomplish a mission. Yeah. The, the higher level people, right, can say what the mission was and what it was for. But I think reframing that in my own heart and my own mind really made a difference in my life of saying, don't get caught up in what the politicians were doing. Get caught up in, did you accomplish the reason, the mission that you were there for? And, and that's what helped me to kind of heal and move forward. So I, I think some of the things you're saying are really going to resonate with our listeners. What's, so from the inside, what's, what's discouraging to you? And then what's encouraging to you about what's going on and what the future looks like? Yeah, I love this question. Thank you for asking both sides, right? Because um, discouraging um, is really just, um, you know, I again, I think this is the reason why I wanted to tell the whole story, whether it's, um, and I tried to include positive examples of leadership, positive examples of where decisions were made that were right and good decisions, as much as um, decisions that um, were maybe not the best decisions that we saw consequences kind of unfold later. And so um, I would say discouraging wise, I am discouraged by um, the DOT and I'm not pointing fingers and I'm not trying to blow up things. It's really just the reality of the DOD over time. Once you understand the story over time, trying to figure out how to take care of such an incredible incredible amount of service members and their families. We're talking about over 2 million service members and their families. Um, they needed to yeah. 
privatized to do that. Who's going to help us with housing? They're, you know, the DOD is in charge of winning wars, not maintaining housing. And so whether it's medical care or housing or some of those other things that families needed, they expanded and privatized. And so now we're dealing with, I'm sure listeners have heard about the mold crisis and mold and yeah. housing and barracks as an example. And so we are a long way off from having that fixed. And that makes me incredibly sad and discouraged to see that their families are still struggling with um, housing that is not fit for their families to be in. Yeah. There's definitely some huge issues when it comes to um, we need more providers. There's definitely a national shortage of medical providers and mental health providers, but even more so um, providers that are willing to take TRICARE. I myself am a military spouse and a TRICARE provider, and yet I abandoned the contract to be in network because of um, just the bureaucracy that's a part of that. And so there's very few providers. And so when we talk about suicide numbers, when we talk about telling um, service members and their families to go get help, whatever kind of help that is, the next question is, well, where do they go get help if there's massive wait lists everywhere? And so that is something that we're working really hard to do advocacy on and to really um, help people understand what the issues are. Um, and I'm really hopeful that we're going to make some progress on that. But it's still discouraging to see when you see online and social media people really still struggling with some issues that I wish would have been resolved a long time ago. Um, but as far as what's encouraging, you know, um, even though we talk about a recruitment crisis and people being burned out, I will say the most encouraging thing to me still is this community is an incredible um, tribe of people that, like I said earlier, yeah. have this common purpose that are willing to save the person next to them, to live for the person next to them, to sacrifice um, even their evening to take care of someone else's kids. Like it is an incredible community that has that shared value system that I believe is, is strong still. And I think that's the reason why those Gen Z that are joining, I think that's why they're joining because they're seeing unity. They're seeing common values and people wearing the same uniform and less division and less polar opposites and arguments going on in the military community, as well as potential for a great career and some provision for their family and it being a smart financial decision. And so I think those that are coming in see that and value what, what we're trying to offer. And I was telling somebody earlier, in a lot of ways, with so much division in the American culture still, um, and still so much, I mean, we're as we're recording this, there's a, a potential government shutdown again looming, yeah. and it's all based off of those polar extremes. And I, I would say, you know, the DOD and the community, the military community tends to be about 10 years behind on a lot of things sometimes. But I will say one thing that we are still trying to hold on to is that cohesiveness and that unity. And that's something I think people are attracted to. Yeah. I've been noticing, um, I've always loved military recruiting commercials. Yes. And I've noticed over the last five or six years that they, they, they changed a lot. Yeah. They, 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 the obvious group of who they were recruiting to changed. And then over the last six months or so, I've seen some of the most powerful and moving commercials I've ever seen, the ones that involve the parents. You know, the, and I think you address that in the book. I read the chapter where you talk about that. But I think it's a fascinating um, insight that somebody had of if we're going to get these young people to sign up, somebody has to say yes in their world. Talk about that for a second. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Because I'm fascinated by this topic, too. You know, it's really the psychology of marketing. It's the psychology of um, how do you find people that are, are wanting to serve? And, it, and it's an important topic that even if you are not in the military space and you're listening to this right now, it's all about marketing and it's all about your internal team and how do you motivate your internal team? And what there's a phrase of um, what you catch them with is what you need to um, keep them with, right? Like, and so when you look over history and you see how the military recruited over time, and this especially started in 1973 when we switched to an all-volunteer force, it switched from, from the draft where we're just going to pull a name out of a hat and you got to serve, right, to we've yeah. got to actually go and convince people to join. And so that's when the marketing strategy started. And so over the years, we've seen everything from sign-on bonuses 
um, to, I loved the eighties where it was, uh, yes, it was be all you can be on the army side, but really the strategy was, um, let's be the family that, that these families need. Like, let's be kind of the father figure that we're going to provide for their every need. We're going to give them childcare. We're going to give them housing and we're going to be there for them when we really need them to. Then that yeah. ended up creating a dependency. And we find in the nineties, they had to change that slogan. And now it's, um, we're going to take care of you so that you can take care of yourself <laughs> yeah. and distance that. And so then you get to millennials where there was a lot of marketing towards parents um, because there was a lot of what everybody was talking in the culture about helicopter parenting and the parents really having the pulse on what their kids were doing. And there's a little bit of traces of that still. Fast forward to today, um, be all you can be is back again. And it's yep. really catering to Gen X um, in our childhood of playing G.I. Joe in the woods and playing outside till the, the uh, streetlights come on. And really that nostalgia of service. Um, but I don't have evidence for this. But one of the things that I'm watching and one of the things I'm concerned about is that if we are marketing to Gen X, Gen X is also that generation that's really tired and burned out and probably not wanting their Gen Z kids to join. And so now we're yeah. seeing some shifts in the way that the military is recruiting, going back to bonuses and maybe even talking to Gen Z kids who may have entered college, but not sure if they actually want to finish college um, or are yeah. struggling to finish college. So you can see there's always these like, what do we do if there's not going to be a draft? Who has in the military would say, who's the belly button? Like, who's going to be the one that makes that decision for that um, new recruit to come in? And I think that's a huge mystery still to the DOD. Wow. You finished a book with a story called Not plastic soldiers are not just plastic soldiers and it's really powerful and moving like give us a couple of minutes on this idea that you finish the book with and then we'll, we'll try to wrap it up yeah uh you know um the the story i was holding on to that while i was writing the book because i had had i had this vivid memory of um at a, being at a spouse event and you know most of the time spouses are these were, actually was a group of chaplain spouses and chaplain spouses, you know, we bounce all over the place. We can be attached to armor and infantry and all kinds of different, you know, at one point we were with intelligence. And so my husband was trying yeah. to explain the army and explain the military to this group. And the best way he knew how to do it was to take a bunch of plastic green army men and some helicopters and, you know, some toys basically. And we had a cake and he was like, okay, pretend that the cake is the mission. Like that is what we are going to, you know, we're going to attack the cake is what we need to do. And we've got to have yeah. air power and we've got to have tanks and, you know, and you've got your foot soldiers and your foot soldiers, the tankers call um, crunchies, you know, which is really funny and everybody laughs. Yeah. And, but the objective is the cake, right? And and I was watching everybody was laughing and it was such a wonderful thing to laugh because it, it reminds you of the playfulness that we all need and such a serious topic. But the more I sat back and watched, the more I, I thought about these green plastic army men who are, you know, are are molded into certain positions and and you buy them in yeah. buckets of a hundred at a time. And and if you've ever played with them, you roll over them with bouncy balls and lose them in the sandbox and you can always go and buy more. And they're they're these disposable and they're less expensive than your tanks and your helicopters and your planes and your airframes and all of that. And I just as I wrote the book, I thought about um, how much both on inside on the military side, but also the American culture, how I just didn't want this amazing group of people that I've served with that have served me, that have served my family um, to be forgotten. And so many past generations, so many past veterans and their families have been forgotten. Um, and the more we get distant from those wars, the longer that we get that distance from the Afghanistan exit, um, the more it's going to be forgotten just how much that um, our whole country went through during that time. And I just wanted to have a visual to end the book to go, you know, we are more than green plastic army men. We need to be careful to not treat ourselves that way. Um, my hope yeah. and I believe the DOD doesn't see us that way. But um, when when numbers you have to have numbers to win wars, you really do. Um, at the end of the day, that's the institution's job is to fight and win yeah. nation's wars and deter future threats. Um, a lot of times it's going to come down to numbers. But I hope we as people, whether you are in the military or not, can see the person in front of you as a person, not as disposable, 
not as forgotten, but just be willing if we could all slow down and hear each other's stories. I feel like that's the place to connect on a human level, having respect for each other, um, and just listening to each other's story and being willing to meet those human needs is really what I want people to, to come back to. And, and that includes pausing long enough to read a book, which is not really done much anymore. <laughs> that's right. I think that's a beautiful – actually, zoom that out. That idea is good for our whole society. I mean, slow down. Get to know each other. Hear each other's stories. There's so much hope in that. Give us some hope for Veterans Day today. Like as we as we finish this up, this, this episode is going to play on Veterans Day weekend right before your book comes out next Tuesday. Go get the book, folks. Give us a little, a little bit of a message for Veterans Day for those listening out there. Yeah, just a quick reminder, not shaming anybody, but just remember Veterans Day is not Memorial Day. We try to educate that a lot. That's Our right. Veterans Day is a time to remember those who have served, not necessarily those that have died, but you might see a mixture of both on social media and in the news, but it's really just um, a time to remember. And and I would say reconnect, reconnect and find those service members in your community. Be thoughtful of those families in your community. Um, maybe you're passing through the airport and you see somebody in uniform. Um, it's just an opportunity to remember that there are people that are choosing to enter this lifestyle on your behalf as an American citizen so that you can do your calling and do um, and have the talents that you have and have the career that you have and raise the family that you have. And it's our honor to do that. Um, but it's an opportunity this weekend to reconnect and remember those stories, to ask about those stories. Um, and again, instead of maybe saying thank you for your service, can I just invite you to Pause for a second, like we said a minute ago, and think about what does it mean to you to have, you know, two million service members and their families that are willing to put their families on pause, putting their marriages, not necessarily on pause, but enter into that difficulty um, so that we have a country that is safe, so that we have a country where we do have freedom to go about our business, to do our jobs, to raise our families, and so that we don't have to deal with some of the things that we're seeing in the Middle East today. Um, I, I would accredit that to the amazing military community that we have that's protected our nation since 9-11. And so it's a great time to just kind of pause and reflect on that, to say thank you to someone, to maybe just invite them into conversation. If you see a service member and they're clearly a service member and they're with their spouse, tell the spouse thank you too. They often feel invisible. The kids that's often right. feel invisible. Pay for a meal. If you, last thing, if you're a provider, um, or, you know, think back to World War II. Maybe you had stories of your grandparents, of everybody pulling together, the nation pulling together. Think of how you can use your talents to serve this community, um, to support whatever deterrence or global conflicts or war efforts that these families are still enduring. Um, right. As a dentist, give back and serve more military families. As a mental health provider, put it on your website. Maybe more than just a discount, just kind of have those um, scripts, if you will, those um, words kind of in your back pocket, metaphorically, yeah. um, to just connect with those families again. It's beautiful. Friend, if you're listening out there and you've been concerned about what's happening in our country and in the military and you're worried about the future, I'm just telling you, there's good people working hard on the inside. Corey Weathers is getting it done. Thank you for the work that you do, traveling the world, encouraging, researching, learning, teaching. And I pray that this book will be one of those that makes a difference in the inside the culture and out. And uh, we're just praying for your success, Corey, and thank you for your time today. Thank you, Lee, so much for your time as well. Absolutely. God bless you. What a great talk. Corey and I had a great time, and I hope you learned a lot as I did. Hope you have something new to say instead of just thank you for your service. And I hope you learned something about military culture ship that would inspire you to go out and pick up her book. It's incredibly valuable and important, especially at a time like this when everything is changing so much. And if you know or love somebody who is or has served, Get yourself a copy of Military Culture Shift, and it'll help you have a new set of things to pray for them about, converse with them about, know about, about what's going on inside their heart and heads. And I hope you had a great time with this conversation. Hey, friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind. I'm Dr. Lee Warren. I'll talk to you tomorrow. But you can start today. Hey, thanks for listening. The Dr. Lee Warren Podcast is brought to you by my brand new book, Hope is the First Dose. It's a treatment plan for recovering from trauma, tragedy, and other massive things. It's available everywhere books are sold, and I narrated the audio books. Hey, 
The theme music for the show is Get Up by my friend Tommy Walker, available for free at TommyWalkerMinistries.org. They are supplying worship resources for worshipers all over the world to worship the Most High God. And if you're interested in learning more, check out TommyWalkerMinistries.org. If you need prayer, go to the prayer wall at WLeeWarrenMD.com slash prayer wleewarrenmd.com slash prayer and go to my website and sign up for the newsletter Self Brain Surgery every Sunday since 2014 helping people in all 50 states and 60 plus countries around the world. I'm Dr. Lee Warren and I'll talk to you soon. Remember friend, you can't change your life until you change your mind and the good news is you can start today.